Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Market Talk. We're delighted to be joined today by Tanya Hugo, who is the Director of Operations for Europe at Hard Rock International, um, and also Michael Eyre, who is the Culinary Director at Jestic Food Service Solutions. Uh, hello to you both. Thank you, thank you for joining us. Um, obviously, a lot happening in the in the marketplace and the industry at, at the moment as, as we get back to. Uh, to reopening and, and hopefully building this this recovery that, that everybody desperately wants. Um, Tanya, we'll, we'll begin with you if that's okay. Um, mm -hmm. I understand that you, in your role, look after about 50 different venues for, for the Hard Rock Group. Um, and that covers obviously a number of markets in, in Europe. Due to the pandemic, I, would, you know, I guess these are at very different stages of, of kind of opening and closure and so on. Can you give us some insight into the sort of the current state of play as it were? Yeah, absolutely. So yes, I do. Um, I do supervise 50 units. Um, I actually look after Europe and then I'm also looking after the Eurasia, Africa and Southeast Asia region at the moment, which includes India. So, I mean, there's a pretty broad um, sort of spectrum in terms of what's happening in Northern Europe to what's happening in Southern Europe, the Middle East and even India as well and Africa. Um, I would say that, you know, obviously it's going according to the waves and we have had a couple of really, really tough months. Your sort of Q1, Q2 has been extremely challenging for Europe. While at the beginning of the year, India, for example, was doing pretty well. Um, sort of the Nordics, you know, throughout the whole of last year, they were probably the country that implemented the least restrictions, but they did end up implementing restrictions as well. Um, so it's been sort of quite varied across the entire region that I supervise. At the moment, it seems that over the last sort of two, three weeks, Europe is definitely reopening, which is very encouraging. Obviously, within phases, um, you know, in outside dining first, then inside dining, sort of 30, 50 percent capacity. You know, curfews seem to be falling away now and restaurants are able to open in the evenings. There are still some restrictions on, you know, alcohol in certain countries, but it definitely seems to be it looks like we're turning the corner. Um, so definitely positive for the moment with some recovery um, sort of stronger in, in some markets versus others, right? For example, the UK has, for me, has opened sort of quite strongly, yeah? Uh, with Oxford Street um, having some fantastic sales and Newcastle as well. So I'd say the UK is, 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 um, is doing really well. Right, that's good to hear. Um, obviously, Hard Rock Cafe, you know, it's, it's an iconic restaurant chain. It's very well known for its, its US-inspired menu and, of course, all of the amazing you know, music and rock memorabilia that, that, that are contained in all of your restaurants. Um, would you say that the, the company has had to adapt its business model in order to emerge from the pandemic in a, you know, in a, in a positive light? Or did you feel it's, it's quite a sort of COVID proof business model that you operate? One of the first things that we did is we spent a lot of time working on <clears throat> COVID guideline, protocol, and manuals. So I was very, very involved in that. Um, sort of a couple of, you know, month or two after the pandemic started, we really invested a lot of time um, and resources into developing, um, you know, all of our safe and sound program, um, which basically incorporates everything from training manuals to signage, to uh, PowerPoint presentations for class training, recertification of all of the staff, um, and really looking into you know the whole training piece um, of safe and sound and COVID, and I would also say very much um, you know especially in in my region you know I used to travel frequently every week I was in a different country prior to COVID, um, and it was pretty much the norm, and I've had to really look at the way I manage the region using technology. So while I would have done in-store visits before in order to validate and check compliance and brand standards and, you know, adherence to brand standards, I've had to do a lot of that using technology. So doing virtual work, work walkthroughs, I call them, um, uh, in order to, to evaluate what's happening in the cafe. And then also as well, even from a training perspective, whereas in the past we would have sent somebody to a certified training store to do their training. We're now having to look at a lot of online training as well. So definitely trying to embrace technology more 
Um, and then the other thing that we've really looked at is the whole delivery piece, yeah? Um, while it wasn't something that we really did a lot of in the past, uh, we've had to really look at sort of packaging, working with third-party aggregators, um, and, you know, analyzing and looking at taking that whole hard rock experience into the home. Okay. Good stuff. That sounds really positive, Tanya. We'll come back to you on that one, but I'll just bring Michael into the conversation now. Um, because I say, as well as the industry in general on operator sites opening up, Jestic itself has opened up its demonstration kitchens in Paddock Wood and in Manchester. So can you tell us a little bit about how that's gone? Yeah, it doesn't sound quite as glamorous as uh, Tanya's <laughs> area of, uh, of uh, geographical um, importance, but uh, we're, we're certainly um, open both of our test kitchens now we've got the uh, the test kitchen down at paddock wood which we've got the fast food test kitchen and the and the restaurant test, test kitchen and we 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 struggle to get people here obviously people weren't allowed to travel um and when they when they were allowed to travel there was the um the importance of coming and seeing a, a new piece of equipment or something so we 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 did um invest in some some technology cameras etc cetera, etc cetera. And managed to to get some demonstrations and some training and equipment training was probably the hardest part with getting out and around the country and you, you sell new pieces of equipment to to customers and they want training on it they want to learn how to use it properly and effectively they've invested in in new technology to try and assist with their operations and if you don't use it properly then then it's it, it's it's not going to be as effective as uh, if, if you do so um it really it really was trying to get people to embrace the zoom and the teams and all of the other platforms that we could do training on and um and it worked okay there's nothing there's there, there is no substitute for face-to-face -face, um training um we've we've made i would think probably in excess of a hundred training videos in the period since um since the first lockdown and there we, we've tried to keep them really small bite-sized pieces so um less than a minute and you could have 15 or 20 different videos on one piece of equipment so people can go back and pick which bit they want to watch not have to troll through a whole 45 minute video so that was one of the things but getting the kitchens open has been has been the most important thing for us and we're seeing more and more demonstrations now. We're doing a lot of um, development work with some of our bigger high street customers now looking at new pieces of equipment or new ways of using their existing equipment um, and just trying to do that. And the, the, the test kitchens are both getting busier. Uh, Manchester, we're, we're more slowly re-engaging re with because... Um, we have to travel from from Kent um, to Manchester to man it. So trying to get a block of of demonstrations together, we've done it a few times over the last few months, where where we've managed to get a block of um, demos booked in. But that's something that we're we're trying to get more um, more engaged with with Manchester. But down here in Paddock Wood, we've been we've been pretty busy. Um, I think we had about eight or nine demos the other week so try, trying to get two a day through and clearing up between one and the other we've actually got two separate kitchens here so we can fairly easily separate those um those, those demonstrations during the day as well so yeah so how, how have you managed with them um, the whole social distancing component okay. then has that put a spanner in the works or have you has that been quite it, smooth to reopen with it, that in place it's, it's been pretty smooth generally we don't have mass demos, so we don't have 10 or 15 people turning up. It will be one, two, three people. And um, they could potentially be the same family. They could potentially be in work bubbles. So um, we've kept our, our side of the kitchen to us as best we can. And then the, the guests sit around the, we've got a big central island in the, in the main test kitchen and that's been blocked off so there's there's space around and about um obviously sanitizer everywhere and masks until you're sitting down and all the all the wonderful um 
COVID compliance that we've had to go through with the office. But what we've been able to do, because we've we've spent an awful lot of time um, getting the office COVID compliant, um, we've been able to roll that through the kitchen as well. So it, it was very much one way systems and all that kind of stuff. They were already in place. So it meant that we were fairly, it, it was fairly, fairly easy to do it. Um, one, once the main bulk of the work had been done, it was, as I say, fairly, fairly easy to, to roll it through the test kitchen. And just because they're quite big spaces and we've got fairly small numbers of people in there, it's, it's pretty easy to keep, keep socially distanced. Uh, Michael, I know before the pandemic, you had a, you know, a really packed agenda in terms of uh, the, the kind of training and um, menu development work that you, you did face to face in, in those facilities, and particularly the one in, in Kent. Do you envisage a time when it gets back to that level or do you, do you think now there will be some operators that just want that kind of um, support on an online, online basis? I, I, to be honest, I think we're almost back where we were um, pre-COVID um, as far as demonstrations. Certainly on-site training, um, we're, we're definitely as busy now. Um, we're probably, if, if I had to put a number on it, we're probably 75% of the way back to... to normal um as far as demonstration numbers are concerned i think what we, we, we're trying to space them out a little bit more and um, give us a little bit of time to reset in between but it's as i say with two separate kitchens it's pretty easy to set up for both yeah. in the morning do one and then just move into the other kitchen do the other one if that's if that's how we're we're operating on the day but it's it's been pretty uh Pretty, pretty good and very busy, um, both with end user customers and high street um, chains. With. Excellent. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Great. And great. I've, actually, I've actually been into London twice in the last month as well, which has been lovely. It's uh, I was I was up in town on um, Thursday last week, and the sun was out, and but it is still really eerily quiet, um, but. Yeah, it was lovely to actually be up near London Bridge and be in a in a development kitchen looking out of the window at the shard. It was just it was just nice to to be back in London and I never thought I'd say that, but I've really missed being in in town. I think I've just missed being being with people, to be honest with you. And much as it's lovely being on Zoom with you guys this morning, it's uh it's, it's not the same as sat around with a couple no, of coffee. No, that's right. And um yeah. speaking, of, speaking of London, it's obviously a good segue uh into the uh, next, next, next question, really, for Tanya. You know, Hard Rock's renowned for the the, the restaurant that it has um, in, in the heart of London. But one piece of exciting news for, for you guys is that you've also just launched a restaurant in Newcastle, and, and obviously you've been spending some time there um, yeah. recently to to support that launch. Tell us why why Newcastle and why now? I think uh, I think it's quite an iconic city, and I think that the people in Newcastle really. You know, many people that I've spoken to are really crazy about the brand. The franchise partners that we have, they are so enthusiastic. And that project was probably, <clears throat> excuse me, underway for about a good three years. I mean, obviously, COVID delayed the whole process, you know, when it came to <clears throat> trying to get the restaurant open. Um, but I think it's a vibrant city. It's uh, this fantastic nightlife there. Um, I think, yeah, I think it was it was the perfect place to to open a cafe. Yeah, obviously, as uh, Andrew said, most people will be familiar with your London site. So, yeah. I mean, does opening in Newcastle sig signal that you're going to expand operations within the UK? Are you looking at uh, other franchise partners? I think uh, we're always looking at new franchise opportunities. And I think there are other markets in the UK that would be interesting you know, for Hard Rock to develop into. Right now we do have, in London um, on its own, we do have three restaurants. So we've got the, the, the Old Park Lane um, restaurant, which is the original, the first Hard Rock that ever opened um, in 1971. It's actually our birthday um, on the 14th of June. So we're going to be 50 years old um, <laughs> shortly. Yeah, and then, um, and then we've also got the Piccadilly uh, Cafe, uh, right on, on Piccadilly Circus and then we also have a Hard Rock Hotel where we have the uh, a cafe inside as well so there are already three in London uh, so Newcastle is the latest edition but I, I'm assuming that yeah if there are more opportunities 
uh, to develop, then, then absolutely. Good stuff. Um, because your sites are quite uh, large, aren't they? So, I mean, the Newcastle, new, the new one can serve 200 covers. So, I mean, what sort of back of house operation does that involve to, to be able to serve all of those diners simultaneously? Yeah, Newcastle was a little bit of a challenge because it's a grade one listed building. So everything from, you know, plumbing to extraction, all of the MEP was, you know, a little difficult. Um, their back of house is considerably small, you know, for the, the capacity of the restaurant that they have. But somehow, you know, we made it work. I think sometimes you just need to try and um, maximize the space that you have. Um, and, you know, in the case of smaller, smaller footprints, we do sometimes have to adjust the menu slightly. But I would say, you know, Newcastle is tight. Uh, but it's a nice size um, and yeah, 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 it's, it's actually a really, really busy restaurant. I think if we had more seats, we'd be doing more covers. <laughs> well, that's, yeah, that's a nice position to be in anyway. And yeah. um, some of those things you mentioned there, Tanya, I guess we'll be familiar with you, Michael, in terms of some of the challenges that the operators face now, you know, in terms of footprint, um, back of house space, the, the type of cooking applications that, that operators want to use. Very much so, and I think I think people are looking at um, using using their equipment in different ways more so than they ever have done before. It's trying to get more out of of less um, space, less equipment, and and yeah, it's just versatility and ease of use and all those kind of things that that people are looking for. I think the um, I think kitchens will get smaller. They you know they they have done over the years and real estate is getting more expensive. So the smaller the kitchen, the more covers you can get in. It's a fairly simple um, equation. But um, yeah, I think looking at storerooms and stuff like that as well, people, you know, every, everything's gonna get smaller over, over time um, to try and get more people in. And I'm guessing Tanya with your 200 covers in Newcastle, um, is that 200 restricted or is that 200 maximum yeah Just, it's basically that would be the full capacity right now i'm running on about 140 yeah. 150 so with the meter between the tables and the restrictions and the distancing we have reduced the capacity temporarily until the the the, the restrictions lift which i think is the 21st of june right we In hope so. yeah <laughs> if all goes according if ready, to plan yeah yeah, if we, yeah, yeah. If we plan it will be the 21st of june so mm. Hopefully you'll be able to be, be up to running at full capacity, but it's probably yeah. been quite nice to be able to get up and running with a, a, a slightly smaller crowd, is it? Or would you prefer yeah. just and, I, I, and get going max capacity and just get on with it? No, I generally tend to err in, in, in favour of doing things slowly. Yeah. Um, you know, people are still learning, although we spent a lot of time training. Uh, the staff in Newcastle had a training team of 13 international trainers with me and we were there for about a month. Yeah. Um, you know, people do need time to build their skills, to feel more comfortable in the role. So I always prefer to start a little bit more slowly and then people feel confident, um, then, you know, build it up and, and seat, you know, at a higher capacity. And, and Tanya, um, obviously the, the kitchen, the back of house, aspect of it all is, is so intrinsic to the success of, of your operations. How much time do you spend in, on that area yourselves when opening a new store? And do you, do you sort of follow a set template when it comes to the type of equipment that you use? Um, <clears throat> we do have um, various design standards. So we, we, for example, work on a small, medium or large kitchen. And on each of those versions is an open or a closed version. Generally, in, in, you know, recently we tend to be building more open kitchens. So Newcastle is an open kitchen and a lot of the other ones that I've done recently are all open kitchens. Um, and I think because of the volume that we do, we do, we do have brand specifications as well in terms of kitchen equipment. So, you know, I know that the fryers need to be a certain brand. Um, you know, there are a couple of brands that we do accept um, with certain specifications, BTUs, et cetera, et cetera, capacity, volume, the grills, the same. So we have, we've got equipment specifications and also preferred brands that we, we generally tend to work with on a global level in terms of the, the kitchen. In terms of my implication, um, I get involved right from the beginning. So in kitchen design, 
um, obviously each each cafe or each restaurant is a little bit different, right? Um, and I'm very, very involved in kitchen and bar design. I like to look at everything, obviously, from an operations perspective. You know, how is it going to work for the guys that are working there uh, in the space? So um, I'm involved in that. And then throughout the entire opening process, um, I'm literally in the kitchen every single day. You know, if it's commissioning equipment when I get on site um, to, you know, reviewing schematics and layout of the kitchen with the kitchen trainers, um, looking at temperature control, looking at, you know, everything that's regarding food safety and sanitation, um, following up on training, you know, getting into the kitchen myself to do line checks, you know, checking quality, checking temperatures. Um, I don't know, I think the back of house for me, you know, I, I always try and go and spend some time with the dishwashers. I always can spend some time with the prep staff. Very often they're the unsung heroes, yeah? Mm -hmm. And um, I, I definitely try and spend enough, well, much as much time with them as I can, yeah? I think it's, it's important that you're there whether, you know, it's moral support or whatever, I think, you know, we just can't afford to forget about that area. It's the heart of the house, yeah? Yeah, Brilliant. Absolutely. yeah absolutely. Um, just uh, picking up on something you said about open kitchens, it kind of ties into a recent launch through Jestic, because you guys recently introduced the Mabrasa Perilla Open Grill, Michael. So can you tell us a little bit about that? And is that kind of um, leaning into the trend for theatre cooking? Yes, um, the 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 fire, as it's called, is is an addition to the um, to the Perilla range from Mebrasa. It's just a little bit more theatrical. It's got the big windy handles on the top for raising and lowering the grills, and you've got the fire basket in the middle of it, so you can actually burn wood in that and create your own um, ash bed and uh, and almost your own charcoal. Um, but you're getting a certain you, you're using charcoal as the main fuel source but the, the wood adds a little bit of um theater and and also a, a slow trickle of extra embers for your for your ash bed so um adds to that yes um i mean the the Mabrasa range the the entire range whether it's ovens grills perillas um robatas etc etc they're all they all lend themselves so well to open kitchens. Um, people love seeing flames. They love seeing fl smoke. They love seeing movement, and and that kind of equipment certainly uh, certainly adds to that. Yeah, so th those kind of solid fuel or cooking appliances, they are proving popular, but it can also create additional challenges in terms of ventilation and that kind of ventilation is an interesting one because um, we we looked into this years ago when they rewrote DW172 when Visa um, decided to rewrite that there was no um, charcoal or solid fuel of any description um, covered in that um, so we we sat down with the guys that wrote that and um, Hamilton and um, Big K and various other people and it's it's very different how you how you extract wood and charcoal um, because of the, the products of combustion. So when you burn wood, you create creosote, and, which is a sticky tar that lines your, lines your flue. Um, when you burn charcoal, you don't, but you do get soot coming off it. So there, there's, there's, there are different challenges with wood and charcoal. And if you're burning wood in a charcoal appliance, it has to be extracted as a wood burning appliance. If you're burning wood in a, in a, in a hybrid, um, oven if it's uh, if it's uh, like a, a pizza oven for example um you're burning wood and gas and you you have to then you always take the worst case scenario so it has to be uh, extracted as a as a wood fired appliance so yeah i mean it, it's pretty well covered in the in that document as to what you can do and what you can't do and what the laws are and what you need and what you don't need um and as long as you stick to it and and extract everything properly you'll, you'll be okay i mean carbon monoxide is the biggest issue with um with with charcoal yeah, certainly but you get a co meter in there and keep your keep your extraction on for the for the advised amount of time you should be okay um yeah but yeah 
And Michael, one question on, on the um, on the supply side. We're hearing a lot at the moment about uh, you know short shortages that are happening and <laughs> difficulty in getting materials and the knock-on effect this has for lead times. You obviously work with a lot of European and North American manufacturers. Are you are you sort of getting any bottlenecks that are causing any difficulties? We do. We're seeing. Uh, I think. I think there's there's challenges everywhere. Um, we're we're seeing longer lead times from manufacturers. I think they're having issues getting uh, raw materials. Um, I think the uh, I, I've heard that the manufacturer of ventilators over the last 12, 14, 15 months has led to a, a shortage of some components that are shared between um, cooking equipment and it's um, main, mainly the manufacturer of boards, uh, control boards. Um, I think there's been some some issues with supply on parts for that. So that's pushing lead times out. I think um, we, we had a container on a boat or ship, should I say, that was sat off Liverpool for two or three days waiting for a waiting for a docking uh, space. Um, I think there's. I'm, I'm not sure if this is off the back of the uh, of the Suez Canal issue, where the boats were piling up in there, and then they were let through, so there were more boats coming through in a shorter period of time. I'm not sure, but the uh, we're certainly seeing some challenges with with lead times on equipment. Um, we are trying to mitigate those as much as we can, um, ordering extra stock. We're certainly um, seeing a bit more air freight going on at the moment. Um, so our, our core customers are not suffering um, as, a, as a result of that. We're trying to, so trying to manage it as best we can using, using air freight, but obviously that gets, uh, that gets expensive. Yeah. Um, and yeah, if we can bring small bits in, to, to ease the burden then we then that's what we're doing but it's it's certainly it's not all plain sailing at the moment getting equipment in from anywhere in the world i don't think it i don't think it matters where it is yeah to be. or uh, yeah or well, many other materials for that matter i think oh you know, well, yeah i think I mean, trade everything, or, everything it's uh, i think everybody's uh, struggling to get that's right yeah uh, and Tanya, just to come back to you and continue the theme on your work on the, on the kitchen side, um, mm -hmm. we're looking forward over the next year or so. Can, can we expect to see any changes to the way that you, you know, operate back of house or any new applications or platforms that you'll be introducing to the, to the kitchens within the Hard Rock estate? I mean, we do already operate, you know, with um, various types of software in terms of cost control inventory or ERP back office, yeah. Um, I think, you know, continuing to work with those kind of tools is critical. Um, and we do already work with, you know, KDS screens in the kitchens. Um, other than that, you know, I think I would like to see more technology in the kitchen. So maybe, you know, due to the, the, the challenges around travel and hopefully, you know, those it'll improve uh, with time but be able to use more technology in a kitchen environment in order to train, right? So train managers on how to do a line check, train kitchen managers, you know, on, on you know, whether it's food safety and sanitation, temperature control, uh, even recipe execution, yeah? I think, you know, there's a, there's a huge opportunity uh, in terms of technology and, and going digital uh, in the kitchen environment, I think for training purposes more than anything else, because you can't mm -hmm. just, easily send somebody to, you know, another country to train like we have done in the past. So I think definitely more technology. Yeah. Good stuff. Well, we're, we're about out of time, I'm afraid, this week. But thank you very much, Tanya. Thank you very much, Michael, for joining thank us you. this week. Thank you. And join us again next week for another episode of Market Talk. <laughs>